Okay, so I think we can probably get underway now. Uh, welcome everyone to, to today's webinar. Uh, I'm Sam Manning. I'm a postdoc in uh, anatomy and developmental biology at Monash University. And today, yeah, I'm very happy to, to welcome Dr. Matthew Grouse, who's going to be uh, talking to us today about uh, quantitative molecular imaging and using that to assess transcription. Uh, so I'll just give a, a bit of background on, on Matthew's career. So he uh, did his PhD in nanoscience and microsystems engineering at the University of New Mexico, and uh, then moved on to, to do his graduate research investigating host pathogen interactions between dendritic cells and a pathogenic fungus using super res microscopy. And then continued the microscopy theme, moving to the, the Gauss Laboratory uh, in UNSW uh, in 2018 to study mechanisms of T cell receptor activation. And after that, in 2020, he joined the David Richmond program of cardiovascular development, um, studying gene regulation and edit editing, which is headed by Associate Professor uh, Matthias Francois, which is where he currently is. And uh, that's the work he's going to be talking to us about today. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much for joining us, Matthew. And we're really looking forward to your talk. Hi, right, great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the committee for inviting me to give the talk today. All right, so I guess we're off then. So thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Um, for my talk today, I will be describing how we use single molecule imaging to investigate on-target engagement of transcription factors to assess the different regulatory layers of transcription. Because our lab studies vascular biology through the lens of developmental biology, I'll be using an example of, of a vascular uh, transcription factor to basically showcase some of the microscopy we use and how we used it to answer some of our questions. So one of the goals of our work is to try to understand the molecular mechanisms of transcription regulation. It's known that transcriptional regulation controls endothelial cell fate decisions, but it's unclear in how this arises from a molecular basis. The way we've chosen to investigate this is to use genetics and animal models in correlation with single molecule imaging. This allows us to ask questions um, that and answer questions essentially on how to how different proteins affect phenotype and then take that phenotype and then really nail down the mechanism of how that dysregulation occurs to then learn more about actual the regulation pathways in place to stop that from happening. So to investigate this, we utilize our knowledge in endothelial cell specific transcription factors such as the SOXA family. So the SOX family members are well-established regulators of cell fate decisions during development. Specifically, the SOX F family members include SOX7, SOX17, and SOX18, which are all pivotal in cardiovascular development. The SOX F factors orchestrate endothelial cell differentiation um, into the developing heart, blood vessels, and lymphatic vessels, and they interact with a variety of specific cell type-specific protein partners to affect transcription of genes for critical for cell phenotype and function. So the dysregulation of these systems is quite powerful and will be like during development would basically cause massive uh, phenotypes uh, in terms of severity and disease. So because the SOXA family members play a crucial role in this vessel development, mutations or knockouts of these genes are a cause for vascular diseases. An example of this is a mutation or knockout of SOX18, which I've shown several um, examples above, which can lead to multiple issues such as lymph lymphangiogenesis, arterial specific, uh, specification, and angiogenesis. So because the SOX18 is, can, controls or is the gatekeeper for a lot of this kind of vascular development, any kind of dysregulation can lead to these severe or even more or even like causing death due to these dysregulations. So because of that, the dysregulation of transcription factor activity can give rise to these severe phenotypes. And the goal is to kind of understand this both on, on a phenotypic and molecular level. So to do this, we really need to investigate the multiple regulatory layers that make up what is transcriptional regulation. 
These include chromatin condensation state, which dictates the number of binding locations available for transcription factors to interact with, the oligomeric state of those transcription factors, which will enable binding at specific locations and motifs within the genome, many transcription factors dimerize to bind to their DNA regulatory domains and regulate transcription as dimers. This can either be homo or heterodimer, and depending on the coupling or the dimer formation will really dictate where in the chromatin or in the genome that they're able to bind, as long as their motifs are close enough together for that dimer to uh, bind to. And, that, um, the and then the dynamic interaction of the transcription factor with themselves and the chromatin, kind of the binding dynamics and dwell time and mobility of how they move around, really put together are what orchestrates um, basically gene regulation through space and time. And all of this regulation layers are happening simultaneously. So it's really hard to kind of nail down where, which layer and what part of the dysregulation pathway is occurring for when it does occur. So this is why it's so imperative to try to understand what molecular mechanism is. It helps us, uh, it informs us of the cause of rare vascular disease. It helps us establish models for not only uh, dominant negative mode of actions, but other disease causing uh, transcription factor mode of actions, as well as a new conceptual framework for how to actually maybe stop this or stop the dysregulation using drugs and using transcription factor to drug transcription factors to uh, impede this. So the way we, in our lab, we've gone about doing this is to use a couple of tools in our tool belt. And one of them is to use a genetic disease specifically for SOX18 because it has a negative dominant mutation within that gene. We know that mutations within the SOX18 gene causes blood and lymphatic vascular defects in humans. This disease is called HLTRS. Uh, individuals that have HLTRS exhibit leaky lymphatic vessels, various cardiovascular defects, renal disorders, and, sp and sparse hair follicle development. We also know that there is a mouse counterpart to these mutations, which is called RAGID. The same mutation occurs both in humans and in mice. So that's quite helpful in terms of uh, tool development as well that we can use different species versions of this to assess in both a mouse model, because clearly we can't do like work directly on humans. So we also, so we also know that the dominant negative mutant of SOX18 drives these vascular phenotypes and is not well understood really at a molecular level. So the dominant negative version of SOX18, the mutation, I'll just call it ragged for now for simplicity, is caused by a point mutation in the C-terminal domain. This point mutation causes a premature stop codon to arise, leading to the truncation and scramble of the C-terminal domain, which basically affects the sox ability to, number one, interact with the chromatin, and then number two, interact with uh, itself. So to determine how the dominant negative mutant SOX18 drives this vascular phenotype, we perform chick, uh, chip seek experiment um, then this ChIP-seq experiment was designed to identify binding or was used to identify binding motifs in the chromatin for designated uh, like tagged, tagged proteins. In this case, the tagged proteins would be SOX, ragged opossum, or which is ragged, which is designated as RAOP in this, as well as a mixture of both the wild type and the mutant version together. So the experiment was basically designed to look at how the different versions of either SOX by itself, the mutant by itself, or them together basically is affected across the entire genome and how RAGID then interferes on the genome-wide scale. So the CHIPC showed us that the dominant negative SOX18 causes a multi-layered interference pattern in, at the genome level. It did this through competitive binding at the same binding motifs as the wild type, which is indicated by the orange lines demonstrating that the dominant negative SOX18 does bind to similar motifs as the wild type does. It also shows that the dominant negative uh, caused loss of binding at known binding motifs, showing that the dominant negative has the ability to absorb the wild type version of the protein and shrink the pool of available wild type proteins for gene regulation. And finally, it also caused ectopic binding to novel motifs, basically meaning that the SOX18, that RAGID, will absorb SOX18, the wild type version, and take it to a different binding site or a different binding motifs. So therefore dysregulating on an even higher level because number one, 
it's not able to regulate the gene the, its uh, gene regulatory network at its proper motif, but it's now also blocking binding motifs of other transcription factors. So put together, the dominant negative SOX18 mutant is capable of interfering with the entire process of gene regulation uh, for SOX18, leading to the, the, se the severe disease and phenotype. But so, but like we already can see that in the phenotype models. This now just is the mole or the genomic version of seeing what how dysregulated that is on the phenotype. But we want to know how this is changing at a different level because ChIP-seq really is a population level snapshot in time where SOX18 is enriched on the chromatin. But because of this, we're not actually able to show how either the wild type or the dominant negative SOX18 mutant interact as a dimer. And as we described before for the regulation layer, we know that SOX18 acts as a dimer for gene regulation. And dimer status is important for gene regulation as well as other protein aggregation and dimer interactions itself. So to understand the dynamics of dimer formation, we need to actually go beyond the sequence the sequencing level of assays and go down to the single molecule to understand the molecular behavior of how this is happening. So to do this, we collaborated with the Heim Lab at Melbourne University to create a single molecule pipeline that investigates protein dynamics. The different imaging methods allow us to investigate different aspects of SOX18 transcriptional regulation. So in this case, we use single molecule tracking to quantify particle mobility and interaction time on the chromatin, and then we also use uh, cross RICs and number and brightness, which can quantify oligomeric states as well as changes in mobility of those oligomeric states. So I'll first go over how the imaging methods work, and then we'll go a little bit more into the biology. So, so CRICS is a type of fluorescence fluctuation spectroscopy. So the way it works is that you fluorescently tag a protein. In this case, we created a SOX18 halo tag. We then measure, then you uh, fluorescently label your protein. You find it within the nucleus of the cell. Then you measure the transcription factor dynamics by acquisition of a time series through confocal images. The way this works is that each confocal like pixel basically allows a single molecule dynamics to be observed through time. And the fluctuation recorded contains information on transcription factor concentration and dynamics. So the basic idea behind this is that as the laser is moving over the PMT, like uh, for your region of interest, it will basically try to create an autocorrelation of the point of like from one pixel to the other, depending on how fast that molecule is moving will depend on how the basically the shape of that autocorrelation, which then can give rise to your diffusion coefficients and oligomeric state. Brightness um, at brightness analysis or number of brightness is <clears throat> basically using these different fluctuation um, measurements and basically assigns them to um, basically the size of these molecules. So if you have very bright molecules, you'll have high variance. If you have very dim molecules, you have low variance. And then based on the signal, it principle is possible to extract each pixels uh, in each pixel, a time series of images for the brightness of a population of the fluorescent molecules. Basically, then using an example of just one um, GFP molecule, you're then able to extrapolate the brightness of multiple or oligomeric X size of GFP molecules. Okay, so to test this idea that SOX18 complex assembly is like dependent or dimer formation is dependent on the chromatin, which we got from the sequencing assay, basically that showed us that SOX18 binds to the chromatin, but we're not sure how, but we know that SOX18 dimerizes. We wanted to then ask the question of, does it dimerize while moving around the nucleus or does it dimerize in a chromatin dependent manner? So to test that, we use different drugs to change the condensation or architecture state of the nucleus to assess this. So first we looked at a non-perturbed cells. So we transfected the halo tag SOX18 in, and then we just basically measured by number and brightness the distribution of SOX18 in the nucleus. And what we found is that the that we do find quite a lot of the dimer state of SOX18 and that it is homogeneously distributed. Essentially, like it's almost everywhere and it's pretty even. There's not that much like aggregation of it. 
We then treated the cells with actomyosin D, which causes chromatin condensation. So basically it closes down all the chromatin. And we found that uh, when we do this, most of the SOX18 is now in a monomeric state. It's still mostly um, like distributed normally, like there's not a lot of aggregates of it, but there is far fewer um, dimer formations than we do see in the wild type or the untreated cells. We finally then also treated another set of cells with trichosatin A, which is a drug that opens up the chromatin. And what we find here is that not only do we see an increase in the amount of dimers in comparison to the, uh, an increase in dimers, but we see a much higher or significant increase in the number of oligomeric uh, SOX18 kind of assemblages. So this basically gives us the idea or like shows us that SOX18 complex assembly or like oligomeric state is chromatin dependent, which I guess was like, this was not really known before because some transcription factors in the nucleus dimerize or oligomerize while floating around where in terms of SOX18, it needs to actually interact with the chromatin for the dimer to form. So to test this another way, we then used uh, cross RICs. So in this experiment, we took our cells and we transfected them with our halo-tagged uh, wild-type SOX18 and then labeled the SOX18 with two different fluorophores because we wanted to now assess how the SOX18 co-diffused together when dimerized. So by measuring the co-diffusion of the molecules, we found that the, the homodimer, we were then able to measure the homodimer fraction, and we then compared that to different SOX18 mutants where we assessed um, where we took away SOX18's ability to basically homodimerize. We did this by, car by creating a SOX18 dimer mutant and a SOX18 alpha helix mutant. So the SOX18 dimer mutant is basically a mutation in the dime, in the dim domain, which is known in, for SOX18 for how it homodimerizes. And the alpha helix mutant, um, since SOX18 has three alpha helices, Two of them, alpha helix one and two, are used for chromatin interaction in binding, where the third alpha helices is kind of used for chromatin interaction, but it's mostly found to be used for, for uh, homodimerization or heterodimerization. So what we found was that when you cause these dime, when you cause these mutations, and then you look at homodimerization fraction uh, measured by co-diffusion, you find that with it's almost completely gone, showing, again, in a different way now, instead of changing the chromatin landscape, we're now changing how the protein interacts on that landscape, that SOX18 dimerization is completely dependent on uh, chromatin. Basically showing, for a fact now, uh, easily showing that there's no way that SOX18 can actually dimerize normally for gene regulation in while it's floating around. It's all done on the chromatin. So we then asked ourselves, based on what we know about uh, how RAGID or the SOX18 do dominant negative mutant caused all this dysregulation in the chip seq act in the sequencing and that uh, assay, we then wanted to see can RAGID actually interact with itself. So we asked the same question: What is the homodimer fraction of RAGID now compared to wild type? So for this experiment, we then co-trans we transfected in either halotag SOX18 or a halotagged version of RAGID. And then we measured the co-diffusion again by labeling the proteins with two different fluorescent molecules. And again, we saw that SOX18 forms a similar amount of homodimerization when it's only SOX18 present. And we found that there's a significantly less amount of RAGID forming, homo, uh, forming homodimers in the nucleus when it's by itself. Now showing that Basically, what we saw in the ChIP-seq assay is starting to make a little bit more, uh, the picture is starting to become a little bit clearer because now the RAGID we find will not actually, or a very small percentage of it will actually bind to itself. Most of the binding we see from RAGID then has to be due to it um, homodimerizing or heterodimerizing with other transcription factors. And finally, we then ask the question, that we were just that I was just describing, which is like, okay, how does it interact with the other molecules? So for these experiments, again, we did uh, C Ricks. We transfected in SOX18 and then uh, a halotype version of SOX18 and put two different fluorescent molecules onto it and measured by co-diffusion. So in the first graph on the left, the, the diffusion coefficient, we can see by black, red, and dark red 
that when you have SOX18 by itself, its diffusion coefficient is quite low, meaning that a lot of it from what we saw from the ligamer, from the number of brightness assay is that a lot of it actually is dimerized, which means it's interacting with the chromatin, so it's moving quite slowly. We find then for the red one, we only have ragged in there that we see that the, it has a significantly higher diffusion coefficient. This also makes sense because in the last slide, we saw that socks that ragged by itself doesn't homodimerize, which means a lot of it is just floating around. But when we put them together, what we find is that the dimer, the heterodimer of the ragged to SOX18 significantly slows down again, basically showing that ragged now is recruiting or absorbing the wild type SOX18. This is also emulated or mirrored within the dimer fraction. In this case, the gray circle for SOX7 is there because SOX7 actually does not form uh, homodimers at all. But the same trend is present when SOX18 is by itself. It has a high dimer fraction. When you start adding in ragged, that dimer fraction becomes, uh, uh, starts become like increases essentially. So now we kind of understand how ragged is kind of messing and dysregulating the system. So next we wanted to understand how SOX18 moved. And to do this, we wanted to, we employed basically single molecule tracking. So for these experiments, we tagged SOX18 with a, um, a fluorescent dye again. So this is the halo SOX18 protein, and then basically imaged how the molecules move around in the nucleus. Now SMT is a little bit harder than just doing RICS, where RICS is a con you just restrict your confocal volume, and then you know that as the laser scans across your region of interest at a certain rate, you can then use that mathematically to then pull out and create your autocorrelation function. For single molecule tracking, you need to use a specific type of illumination. In this case, it's called highly inclined and laminated optical sheet, and also known as HILO. And the reason that we use HILO is because we want to illuminate only a small part of the sample. And we do this by, by high-low creating basically a light sheet that just kind of cuts through it at a very um, a, like uh, deep angle, not as deep as turf, but a deep angle. And in doing so, you can then only illuminate a small portion of your sample and only a small number of the molecules inside of it will become illuminated, therefore reducing your background of the cell. And at the same time, when you're doing single molecule tracking, you also heavily reduce the amount of uh, uh, fluorescent probe you put on because you want to actually be able to see the individual single molecules to, to actually be able to identify and quantify how they move. So the way that single molecule tracking works is that once you transfect your cell, you then label and you can then watch the molecules move through time. So Basically, then you take your time lapse imaging and then on you use an algorithm and basically the algorithm looks at every frame and identifies X, Y positions for every bright point. It then algorithmically threads to these together through time to create uh, these trajectory maps, which is what you see on the right. And the trajectory map is basically the history of how that molecule or that population of molecules moved. And then using that map, you can then kind of pull apart and ask questions about subsets of populations and how they move in different locations within the nucleus. Now, there's two types of single molecule tracking acquisition that we do. We do what we call fast tracking and slow tracking. So the difference between them is that fast tracking is done very quickly at around 10 to 20 millisecond frame rate. And that's really to assess the bound or unbound state. And you can see that in the cartoon that a diffusing trajectory molecule has a very long or big diffusing trajectory. And the bound is very kind of small and contained. They don't, the molecules don't move very much from frame to frame. Whereas slow tracking, we do this at a very slow frame rate, about half a second per frame. And that's really to assess, we're not really looking at how far the molecule moved in that time. We're more asking the question of how long did that molecule um, basically, how long was it, what was its lifetime around for within that same spot? And using that, we can then kind of pull apart and look at the two populations of binding that are occurring, which are called basically short and long lived molecules, which have basically conceptually anything, any molecule that's around for a little bit more than a second 
is considered like a specific binding or a specific interaction with their chromatin. And anything that's less than a second is considered more of a short binding or a nonspecific or scanning kind of behavior looking for a binding motif. And there's different ways to actually identify and analyze your trajectories. So the two ways that we use in our lab is mean square displacement and jump distance. Mean square displacement basically measures the position of a particle with respect to a reference position over time. So basically at frame one, where how far did it move from frame one to frame two? And then how far did it move from frame one to frame three and so on? Where jump distance measures more of where, how long was it around for and how, where did it go within that lifetime? Because if a molecule goes back and forth a lot, then it's mean squared displacement might not, might not move that much, but because of the length of that moving of the back and forth, it's jump distance length can be quite long. So it all depends on what kind of question you're asking for what uh, kind of analysis you want to do. But in terms of our SOX18 data, what we wound up doing is looking at a mean squared displacement. And it's quite obvious when we actually visualize this now why ragged looks the way it does when we looked at it by sequencing and by cross ricks and oligomerization. So the wild type trajectories on the left, you can see that they diffuse quite a bit, but they have kind of like a wide range of how where they move and how they move, where the ragged uh, version of it are very quite condensed down. They're very tight spots. So ragged looks to be almost very sticky in comparison to the wild type version. But now to quantify that, we then need to use, uh, well, to quantify it, we then look at diffusion coefficients. And these are calculated using mean squared displacements from the individual trajectories per cell. The way to read these graphs is a little bit confusing. So I'll just go over it really quickly. So essentially what, you, what the algorithm does is that it finds the inflection point between two uh, basically peaks. And those peaks are basically two different types of population that are able to be found from the trajectories. So anything to the left of that mark of that line is considered to be a bound molecule based on how fast it's moving, its diffusion coefficient. And anything to the right of that molecule is more considered unbound or mobile. So the way that this works is that when we looked at the wild type version versus dom versus the ragged mean, we can already see just by the ratio of the height of the peaks, how different their population dynamics are. So in the wild type, we can see that the majority of the population is diffusing. It's on the right side of that pink bar where the dominant negative or ragged version, we can see that the majority or the higher peak is on the left side of that pink bar basically showing that the average diffusion coefficient over many cells for each of these conditions or, or uh, treatments shows that there's a dichotomy in how the populations are being represented here, basically showing now the actual mobility or dynamic of how the dominant negative has affected the biology and caused this dysregulation compared to the wild type. So, Along with now knowing this, we can then also define and quantify a uh, mobile to immobile ratio, which is basically what I was just describing, but you know, now we can quantify it as well. And then using our um, long dwell time, we can then actually also assess how long the molecules dwell for on the chromatin. So in this case, when we look at long and short-lived, again, long-lived is more of a specific or a chromatin binding interaction, where the short-lived is more of a nonspecific or searching kind of behavior. We can see that ragged, in both cases, has a much uh, significantly higher uh, dwell times for both cases compared to the wild type, showing us, in this case, that even with uh, ragged being so sticky, it still is able to that stickiness is now, as we know, is also going to be at atopic binding sites or directing SOX18 away, the wild type, from any of the binding sites it needs to, basically showing another level of dysregulation with built into the system. So putting all that together, the dominant negative mechanism completely dis like pulls apart all the different regulatory layers in this case. So that's not really good, but it did allow us using the dominant negative uh, as a tool to kind of understand how now dysregulation looks like to understand then how to fix that. So another tool that we've been wanting to, that we've been working on and using in the lab is actually small molecule inhibitors. 
because inspired by nature in the dominant negative fashion, we can infer with uh, regulatory layers using these small molecule inhibitors the same way that we use the dominant negative uh, mutations. So to do this, we need to target known dimerization domains or protein interaction domains on the proteins with small molecules. This would then allow us to study regulatory layers, not only in the dominant negative fashion, but in a pharmacological fashion as well, which is probably a lot more uh, targeted and it probably would not change or hopefully would not mess up as many regulatory layers leading to a better understanding of how the system as a whole works. So um, our lab has spent years developing a panel of small molecule inhibitors to interfere in this case with SOX18, as well as assessing several FDA approved drugs for a repurposing to look at other transcription factors as well. well. So we've also started a collaboration with the Tershkish lab over in San Diego. They have developed a, micros a microscopic imaging of epigenetic landscapes or Miel pipeline that was actually built for phenotypic drug discovery. So the way that this pipeline works is that you label your cells, you treat them with your drug, then you, sorry, you seed your cells, treat them with the drug, fix them, label them with, the, with GAPI and other um, histone markers. The analysis then allows you to do segmentation of the nucleus as well as feature extraction, which then does a multi-paramedic analysis and discriminant analysis to basically ask how are all the cells next are all the cells different or alike from each other, and then plots them on a UMAP uh, kind of system. So in this case, we use one of our drugs and our panel, and we wanted to assess how overexpression of SOX18 affects uh, chromatin condensation state. So in this case, we use Huvex cells. And what we did was we overexpressed SOX18 in these Huvex cells to now ask the question of, we know that SOX18 dimerization is dependent on chromatin, but does chromatin, how is the chromatin affected then by the overexpression of SOX18 in these systems? And what we found was that when you do overexpress SOX18, you completely change the chromatin condensation landscape in comparison to the wild type or non overexpressing form of that. When we add the drug to the system for the non overexpressed cells, we can see that that also changes the system a little bit again because there's already SOX18 in the Huvex cells. But interestingly, when you use the drug on the overexpressed SOX18 cells, it actually rescues it, it brings it more back down it brings the chromatin condensation state down towards a non-overexpressed state, which shows that SOX18 is altering the chromatin state, but it also shows that we can do this in a very precise manner by uh, basically interfering with SOX18 dimerization. So this kind of brings us now into the part of the talk where we're gonna be looking at pharmacological rescue of the dominant negative interference. I just showed you that we could do it in the wild type, but now what does it look like? And can we do this in, you know, four disease states? So previously we, uh, we also like are doing this in animal models as well. In this system uh, where we have a ragged mouse, the corneal, um, actually forms neo or hypervascularization when in the ragged mouse compared to the wild type mouse. And what's really interesting is that when you treat the ragged mouse with one of the drugs on our panel, you can basically stop the hypervascularization of the cornea. Basically now showing that also in a targeted way in an in vivo model, we can also start to break this dominant negative um, interaction. But now the question comes about, like we've just looked at uh, the dominant negative or the ragged model by CRIX and a little bit by SMT in the previous th studies, but now can we actually rescue that? And what does that rescue actually look like? So to do this, we, um, to do this experiment, we performed it by SMT. And what we've done is that we've transfected cells either with SOX18 or SOX18 and ragged and then treated either with the one of our drugs on our panel or with the vehicle for that drug in this case, which is DMSO. Each of the, so SOX18 in this case is tagged with a halo and RAGID is tagged with a snap tag. And we basically just performed SMT on this. And what we found was pretty similar to what we looked at before. So if we go on and go through the colors now, 
The black line on here is our wild type version. So you can see that the majority of the molecules are moving at a higher, are diffusing and not bound compared to the bound state. Where when we look at the red uh, sample now, that is our SOX18 and RAGged put together. And you can see that a lot of, there's a higher ratio of bound molecules than diffusing molecules. When we look at the green line, we can just see how the drug is affecting things. It looks like it's actually segregating a little bit more of the population, but it still shows that there's a higher amount of free uh, diffusing molecules and bound. Now the rescue comes in when we compare the yellow to the red together, because the yellow has SOX18 and RAGA together, but it also has the drug. So we're able to see by this that the ratio is now switched from the red state now to the yellow state, showing that there are more diffusing molecules because of the drug breaking that uh, dimer. We can also see this in the bound versus the like population percentages. Again, you're looking at red versus yellow for your rescue state. And we also can see this mirrored when we look at the long and short dwell times. Again, when we look at the red for the disease state and the yellow for the treatment state, we can see there is a significant drop in dwell time um, that is signified by, as our rescue of releasing SOX18 to then interact with itself and bind to the chromatin again. So now we come to the where the rubber meets the road. What? Since we've now learned all these things about the regulatory networks, transcription networks, and everything else, can we use targeted drug on target engagement in a novel unknown genetic disease? And what does that tell us? So in this case, our lab was contacted in collaboration, uh, was contacted by a hospital because of our work in other diseases such as HLTRS for dominant negative. The disease is unnamed, which means it's novel. Um, and they came with specific phenotypes such as hypertension, bloody gut and bloody stool, blood found in the stomach, uh, which was found by endoscopy. The patient had a porticap because they were bleeding so much, they needed constant transfusions. Um, they eventually, the doctors eventually did a whole uh, genome sequencing. They found that the patient is heterozygous for a specific mutant gene. Um, I can't really disclose at the moment the name of this gene or the drug we're using in the treatment of it uh, due to commercial uh, basically ventures, but uh, you'll just have to go along with this. And then we actually found that through consultation um, with us, we just, we told them what drug to use, that the patient has improved after being um, given this uh, repurposed drug, which is fantastic news. But now the question really comes about is why? What does this look like on a molecular level that we actually do have a rescue of a dominant negative in a, non in a novel disease? So what we've done is we took this gene or the, this protein, which we know has a DNA binding domain and a ligand binding domain, and we created the same mutant that was found in that patient. And again, this looks very similar to a dominant negative mutation where there's a point mutation that causes a premature stop codon and a truncation. This case, it's in the C-terminus, similar to, to the SOX18 dominant negative. But instead of it being just in the C-terminus, it actually is flowing or part of the mutation is also affecting the ligand binding domain, which should also be affecting a lot about how this uh, gene interacts with other proteins and with it itself. So to first even assess how, if this mutation is even like how it's messing with the regulatory networks, we performed SMT. So in this case, we took our halo tag protein we created and then transfected them into us into cells and we performed SMT. So on the graph on the left, the blue line is our mutant and the red line is our wild type. As you can already see, this looks very similar to the dominant negative we saw before, but this time it's switched. Where this time the mutant has a much higher degree of unbound molecules where the mutant has a much higher uh, degree of bound molecules. This is mostly due, uh, this, this <clears throat> profile is basically looks this way because the, the, the gene or the protein we're looking at, we know is a repressive protein. So which should have more under normal circumstances, more bound particles than mobile. 
we then can also correlate this or see how the trending looks when we did uh, some very preliminary experiments using RICS as well. We found that although the diffusion coefficient didn't really seem to increase much by SMT, we did find a significant increase in diffusion in the mutant. But importantly, we did see that there is a possible in, uh, decrease in, or sorry, increase in the bound fraction uh, for the mutant version of the protein. We then, because the, the patient was treated with this drug, we then wanted to know, okay, what do these proteins look like when they are uh, essentially treated with this drug? And again, we basically emulated the last experiment. Instead, this time, we now treated the cells either with drug or its vehicle. In this case, it's PBS. And the reason I had I didn't put up any pie charts or any kind of bound fraction stuff is because, as you can see, it doesn't look like the drug has any effect on this protein or on this gene, which makes you really stop and think. Because what does what is then actually uh, occurring that the child that the patient is actually recovering, but it's not actually affecting the protein that is uh, basically mutated. So the idea behind this then is for this drug, the drug must, or the, the transcription factor, the, the mutated protein must actually have an overlapping regulatory network with SOX18, because from our panel of drugs, we know that this drug actually does affect SOX18. So the idea behind this now is to use SOX18 in such a way to uncouple the transcription, the mutated transcription factor from this other network and see what then things look like. So for these experiments, we did a code transfection where we put in either our uh, wild type version of our transcription factor, a halo type version, and then a snap of SOX18, and we performed SMT again. Now what's very interesting is that when both proteins are together, we can see that when the drug is administered, there is a change in the ratio of bound to diffusing particles. It doesn't look like much on the SMT, but we do find when we look at it by RICS, there is a significant increase in the amount of uh, the protein in the wild type form that does become bound, showing that there might be, in this case, an inference of some sort of either direct interaction or a uh, or a like protein X in between them that um, allows them to interact that when you disrupt that when you disrupt SOX18 interaction or dimerization, now all of a sudden the wild type can work better or differently. We did the same experiment for the mutant version of these proteins. And basically what we found is that the mutant version looks to move a little bit faster by SMT, but by RICS, there was not a significant difference in terms of bound proportion or diffusion coefficient. So basically showing that the mutant version isn't really affected by the drug, but since the wild type is, it kind of shows that there, that at least at the moment, the working hypothesis is that because the patient is heterozygous, there's both a wild type and a mutant version found in all the cells that when you add the drug, the wild type seems to work a little bit better because it can now do its regulatory abilities because it's no longer associated with like aggregate protein X along with SOX18, where the wild, where the mutant version just kind of is just moving around and just causing dysregulation. But further experiments, because a lot of this is preliminary data, further experiments need to be explored and repeats need to be done along with some sequencing because the sequencing assays along with the molecular imaging really do paint like a full picture of regulatory networks and how these interactions are taking place. So in summary, the use of single molecule imaging to investigate these regulatory layers actually is like super beneficial. It allows us to quantify specific aspects of transcription uh, regulation that are not accessible by genomic assays. They allow us to look directly at live interactions of proteins and also to assess live on target drug interactions. Um, so a lot of this could not have been done without the start of the Genomic Imaging Center, which uh, Matthias, Dr. Matthias Francois started. I'm part of it. Uh, Dr. Yu Wong is our computer scientist. He helps develop and create novel, uh, basically, 
pipelines for analysis and everything else. And Dr. Susoff Pardon, uh, he just was recruited. He's a specialist. In, he's a biophysicist that specializes in optical tweezers and basically mobility experiments. So this is a technology training platform. So if anyone wants to come learn how to do super resolution, come contact us and we'll start the training. And again, it's free access, open source. We're happy to disseminate and share any and all uh, like analyses that we like produce. And just as a note for everyone, because I do a lot of single molecule tracking, this is kind of what my week looks like. So we created this dashboard, but before the dashboard, it was two or three days of cell culture, a full day on the microscope, and a couple days of just local localization and tracking and then another couple of days of data analysis. And this is because before, before we made this uh, transcription analysis dashboard, there were so many different scripts and so many different like uh, analysis platforms you had to use. So like, for example, MATLAB was used to do the localization and tracking. Then you had to run three codes in there, then extract your file format and like a text file, move it to R and do something else. Now, after the dashboard, because you put everything together beautifully, um, I can't do anything about the tissue culture and the microscopy side of things, but localization and tracking has now gone down to about an hour for 40 samples. And again, that's dependent on your computer. Like that's on my laptop that I'm running, that I'm talking to on now. If we use our analysis computer at work, 40 samples can take like 15 minutes. And then data analysis, because it's all compiled together within the dashboard, is almost instantaneous. I say 30 minutes because you might sit there and click through everything to try to do your, to try and understand your interpretation. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you to all past members in the lab and present, as well as all of our collaborators, specifically to Elizabeth Hind and JQ down in UNI, uh, in Uni Melbourne, as well as Neftil, Neftali and Sue at SMM here for their help with all the imaging. And thank you very much. Thanks very much, Matthew. That was fantastic. A really lovely... Uh body of work and yeah covering a wide range of techniques and yeah all the way to some therapeutic outcomes as well which is really interesting to see yeah it's it's been a it's a wild ride essentially to go through all that for the to see what you can get and what kind of biology you can get out of it yeah absolutely and it's yeah often rare for microscopists to get to you know get close to the therapeutic side of things so um yeah very interesting project oh, thank um you. yeah anyone who has any questions please feel free to to put them in the q a and uh you can ask them to matt um i'll i'll start things off sure um yeah i, I was very interested by the um the sox 18 protein in general and the, the nature of these mutations and how are the, you talking about the dominant negative or the alpha helices and dimer mutants um, yeah, the dominant negative, and, mm -hmm. and how that can impact the binding profiles of the of the protein. Yeah, um, is that a mechanism that's ever used in a normal developmental setting to alter um, transcription factor binding profiles in in different developmental settings? So maybe like an alternate, like a splice variant, for instance, that might be expressed in a certain tissue to change transcription factor behavior. Oh, I'm not aware of any of that, mostly because that mutation is uh, causes a randomness in the C-terminal tail. So because the way SOX18 wraps around the chromatin, because it's kind of like, a, it's they call it unstructured, right? It's like a wet noodle. You have structured parts and then unstructured parts where they're a lot more wiggly and then a structured part. Having that last tail piece be completely random makes it unstructured and very difficult for it to actually wrap around and into the binding grooves of the chromatin. So I have right. a feeling if any kind of splice variant like that existed, it would be quite uh, hazardous to that individual. Yeah. It's not a, yeah, right. It's, it's, it's not, not a beneficial thing. Change, no. yeah. But one of the things that uh, we've considered and thought about for the drug panel in that aspect is like HLTRS, the one I showed is quite severe. So you can imagine that like most individuals have to be heterozygous of that because otherwise they would be, it would be fatal, right? So different mutations of HLTRS, because I showed you a quite severe one. There are ones that are less severe, which means the mutations farther down the C-terminal tail. So it's a smaller truncation. 
So you can imagine in cases like that, if you want to use a drug, not for HLTRS, but maybe you want to stop a minor um, kind of genetic disease. You don't want to like hit it super hard and completely stop all interaction of dimerization occurring. You could kind of tailor back and use maybe a less affinity or a, you know, a small molecule that's not as good at blocking dimerization. So you still have function, but you don't completely block, you, you don't completely block all function, but you stop the actual disease function, the disease dysregulation. Yeah, absolutely. I see. Um, any other questions coming through? Um, yes, we've got one in the chat from Alex Fulcher. Um, I can... I don't see it in mine. Uh, well, I will, I'll read it out for him. Um, okay. He asks whether Averia's uh, Minflux would help with your tracking. I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll I'll um, let Alex uh, talk and he can give any more details. Uh, there you yep. go, Alex. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Alex. How's it going? Um, yeah, for a very nice presentation. Um, thank you for presenting then. Um, so I was, I've been interested in, so STED uh, was a technique for a while and um, Iberia's got a new um, STED-based microscope called MinFlux that mm -hmm. I haven't I've got my hands on, but I'm very interested in using, but it seems like some of your um, single molecule tracking would be aided by that type of um, instrument. So have you explored or have you looked at papers using MinFlux as single molecule tracking and would that aid um, some of the tracking experiments that you're currently doing for your these uh, studies. Gotcha. Um, I've actually not heard of MinFlux before. I'll, I, I'm amateur. You're going to write that down and take a look at that. But no, I, I the short answer is I don't know because I've not looked into it before. Can you describe a little bit more how it would be beneficial? Uh, so basically, the so this obviously using the STED um, depletion laser, mm -hmm. um, but instead of trying to get the super res by suppressing the signal it's actually trying is using something like a d storm or sort of using the blinking um, abilities of the of the fluorophore to and you're tracking really really fast so you know they're talking like you can see um transcription factors in bacteria and they're doing like 36 frame 3600 frames a second or something like that wow that's incredible so, yeah and so it's insane but i don't you know it's all in I, i've read papers and but I, i'm more of a practical person i want to see it and and fiddle mm -hmm. with the microscope and unfortunately i don't think there's one in australia so <laughs> yeah um but it's uh, yeah definitely look into it. and also if you i guess if through your collaborative networks if you have anyone who has access to something like that um yeah absolutely happy sure. to share um so the only thing that i can describe that we've been that i haven't done yet that i'm trying to do is right now i've just been using a uh, halo tag genelia fluoride but there are for the smt part of it for tracking there's also a dye out there that's called the photoactivatable genelia fluoride, which means that you should you can almost bleach down as much as you want, and then because you're firing the 405 laser very uh, quickly, you only bring out a very small percentage of molecules at a time, kind of like the similar idea to D-Storm, but because they're now illuminated via FRET, they're constantly on, so you don't have to worry about them going in and out of focus or blinking on and off for your tracking. So it greatly improves your precision and speed of which you can calculate your uh, dye calculations, well, or yeah, your, your diffusion coefficients. Yeah, well, that would be, yeah, exactly. You're just basically increasing contrast yeah, exactly. massively. Yeah, so and we that, don't, it's not by stead. So I could do this on like just yeah. a normal turf scope. Yeah, exactly. But it's and and it might be more advantageous doing that because you can see a lot more uh, area potentially um, rather than having to do really super fast imaging in a small area uh, that presumably MinFlux requires in order to do that speed. Um, so you've got the whole field of view, but you're just tracking a couple of molecules rather than like exactly. one molecule. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I've seen a couple of papers out like this, like James Liu had one, and uh, there's a couple of them out there that have been using these recently, and I've been quite uh, envious that I haven't gotten my hand on it yet. Yeah, no, look, I think are you, 
you've done it, you've got everything in place to do do great work with new technologies for sure. You understand the um the most important thing, which is the data analysis, for sure. <laughs> Well, that's a point of the, the Genome Imaging Center. If anyone wants to learn, they're more than welcome to contact us and come up and be trained. I might take you up on that offer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> For sure. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Uh, any other questions in the, in the chat? Um, just on the subject of, yeah, the, the analysis and, and how that all goes. Um, I was wondering your thoughts on like different ways of analyzing SMT data. So obviously like with the long, the long binding uh, method of imaging with the 500 millisecond exposure time. Um, so yeah, you are modeling that as like two binding components. Yes. Um, but yeah, I've, I've seen there's some, there's some work out there now that's proposing that there might be more complex behaviors or, you know, that it's not such a, um, two component kind of yes. behavior that there might be like sort of power laws affecting or just better describing the the binding behaviors of transcription factors yeah because obviously you, you often see like quite long binding events that maybe aren't captured in in the that sort of two component analysis so yeah i was wondering mm -hmm. your thoughts on that um i definitely agree with the power law idea behind it in terms of the long dwell time part i think that is still legitimate because you're the two component in that sense is just long and or short and long binding where the i think the multi-component or the a higher degree of non-binariness in the spectrum is in the fast tracking where you don't just see bound and diffusing inside of that there's probably a whole spectrum of different uh rates that are going on that you can describe in different ways which I think is like really cool. I just don't know how to go about doing that because for part of this, what we're doing, you we do have a three component model and it really is completely dependent on how good your microscope is and how good your imaging is. Because if your imaging is not high enough quality to catch that other parameter, that third state or the fourth state or the fifth state, doesn't matter how much analysis you'll do, you'll never pull it out properly with, uh, you know, having good QC. Yeah, so, you can overfit. Data, exactly. Yeah. exactly so i think it is completely dependent on the quality of your data so the reason i say that is i've seen papers like i was just talking about for the photo activatable dye that are only using that now and the, like two of them just came out i think in the last week so they no longer are doing the two component model they're now doing it but the third one because they can actually act, act achieve that third the speed to get that quality of data all the time now not just as like an experiment so yeah. the other way that i've considered this is james lou came out with it a while ago is more like a three-dimensional searching behavior where you can do 3d smt mm -hmm. so that gives a little bit more dimensionality to how far things are moving because when you compact all of your time series down right it becomes just an xy plot in two dimensions so if you add that third dimension back into it these jumps now are more of a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like it acts like a sphere of influence rather than just like where is it and how is it moving, right? Because if everything in the nucleus is 3D, so if you have a point that for an enhancer or a binding motif here and it's just constantly moving up and down here, that doesn't mean there's not one below it based on the loop theory of how uh, all the organization is controlled for transcription regulation. So there could be a lot of misinterpretation by missing out on that third dimension. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of very complex behaviors going on in a nucleus, but um, yeah, we sort of all draw a practical line somewhere to describe the, exactly. the behaviors that are important to our experiments. Yeah, yes. Yeah, interesting to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, in the Q&A. Uh, it just remains to thank you again, Matthew, for a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure everyone who attended did as well. And uh, thanks everyone for attending and um, look forward to, to seeing everyone at the, the next webinar in this series. Right. So thanks.